everything I'm going to show you today is a group effort. And uh, I cannot thank everybody that was involved. As we said, I'm the coordinator of this Beamline, which was the first Beamline to be fully mm -hmm. operational at the, at the new particle accelerator here in Brazil. At the same time, we have, um, we for many years operated the first uh, synchrotron source in the Southern Hemisphere that was called UVX. And as of uh, last year, we started fully operating, uh, not fully, but we started operating the, the new source. It's a fourth generation synchrotron source. I'm gonna show you a short video with more details about it. And um, I was responsible for the project and commissioning of this beamline. It's a macromolecular crystallography beamline. And as I already said, it was the first one to be operational and open for users. We're not yet at full current for, for the ring, but we had uh, out, outstanding results, even though we are like at not even half of the full current. Th this is my team. I have uh, two researchers working for me and one engineer, and uh, we're starting to get students. And this is, um, national facility and we are also open for international proposals so if you would like to talk about that later I'm, I'm totally open for it so all our beam lines have names based on the technique they are all acronyms like manaka uh, is, is an acronym for the technique in macromolecular uh, micro and nanocrystallography and manaka is also the name of the tree so we're, they, they're all named after trees or animals from our uh, local fauna and flora. And that's uh, why this flower is here. And it's a flower that has two colors. It's a jasmine-like uh, plant, and that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna make sense in a bit. So the, the, the I'm gonna uh, talk about the motivation for the this project and how we are doing it like in terms of project and commissioning the initial results and where we're going from, from here. So before I begin, I'm gonna show you the, this video. In our platform, we have a lot of um, short videos about the construction and the initial um, setup of the building. So this is in Portuguese, but I'm gonna direct you through it. We are part of the center like of national labs. We are um, part of our, um, Ministry of Science and Technology. So this is, we're looking at the initial uh, part of the linear accelerator where we produce the, the, the electron beam. And it's showing you here how it's directed through these tubes to the initial ring. So the, this has two uh, accel round accelerators, a booster that's in this uh, most internal uh, wall here and the, uh, um, storage ring on the on the on my left and uh, one an interesting thing about this project is that almost 90 percent of what we're seeing here was built in brazil by brazilian companies so most of the investment was returned to to brazilian companies all the all the electromagnets that are part of the of the rings were built by a brazilian uh, company that's um originally only made motors like electrical motors and they they worked with with uh with our engineers to step up their game and be able to to construct this very delicate and precise electromagnets that we have all around um the the vacuum chamber where the electrons go through was also they were all done here but they, it has a an extra thing that's a collaboration with cern that's a a material that goes inside the chamber. It's a metallic, um, it's not an alloy, it's a, a three uh, kinds of metals, it's called NEG. And it, it, it's, a, it's very interesting, it's um, part of the success of this project as well, because it um, allows us to go to a much higher vacuum inside the chamber. And the, the design of, the mag of these electromagnets around the, the ring is what uh, gives it uh, its um, power, uh, should I say, to accelerate these electrons very, very close to the speed of light. And they are all uh, walking almost in phase. We, we say that they are coherent. And this gives it 
different um, properties. So here you have a view of some of these electromagnets. So this quadrupoles and sextopoles that are uh, responsible for focusing the electrons and making them like run uh, really together and very fast. There's also these chambers that are resonating cavities that give it extra kicks. And as we go around the circle, the, this um, electrons produce light, or that's what we call the synchrotron light, that is then directed to the beam lines, which are our experimental stations. So here we see one of these exits. So in, we're now inside and now we're outside the tunnel. And we, we can have up to 38 experimental stations. You have, you, you see here some shots of the microtomography beam line. And here's an animation of how the light will hit a, first a monochromator to separate the, the color of the light we want. And then we direct it to the sample and collect the data. This is a view from the experimental hall. And now you see the first uh, uh, cabins of um, uh, the hutches of Manaka beam line. So we have one uh, optical hutch and then the experimental hutch where we, we have um, the first experimental hutch of Manaka. So this is gonna be a two uh, hutches beam line. We're gonna go from micro to nano uh, sized focus. And as we are working on Manaka, all the other beam lines are, uh, a few other beam lines are being built. So it's, uh, it's we can have many wor people working uh, simultaneously this is a shot of the of our actual beam line. This is actually a result from the, the microtomography. This is in our beam line now, and I'm going to show you results from um, users from São Carlos, from Professor Glossius Oliva. So this, uh, this, this synchrotron is basically a huge microscope that allows us to, to investigate matter at atomic and subatomic level. It's not uh, a, coll a collider but uh, it actually works as a microscope. So many uh, projects so in different kinds of materials that uh, we have a huge program on soil sciences, so soil sciences. And um, so it's health, soil, um, uh, renewable energies, many things can be studied here. And uh, if you wanna know more, we have lots of um, video interviews in, in this, in our YouTube channel and details of all the, the different parts as well. So in a macromolecular beam line, what we do is starting, we have to start with crystals from very uh, purified proteins, as much of you know. And the main uh, difference of this beam line here at, at Sirius is that we can achieve micro and nano fo uh, focused beams. And that allows us to work with very small crystals, which are the most interesting proteins do, do not yield big crystals. And that's a big challenge for, for structural biology. So we have uh, samples in a cryo loop, or we can also, we're st also starting to work at room temperature. And here is a, is a screenshot of our operational uh, interface. And I'm gonna talk a little more about it. And some of our initial results, we are working with a, a area detector that was op operating the old uh, synchrotron but we are soon going to move to a new uh, detector. We are also part of another collaboration with CERN on these uh, chips for the uh, area detectors. And uh, we have a group here working with a local company building these full detectors and we will be one of the beam lines that we will operate it. So from the diffraction pattern, we can um, calculate and, and generate the, the Im an image of the electron density around these proteins. And uh, from that, we can model the, the proteins and also look at interactions of protein with ligands. And uh, in, that's very uh, important for drug discovery. So this beam line, uh, it's been, uh, we, we have, e e as I told you, even with low, low current, these first results were at 20 milliamps and milliamperes on the, on the main ring and the, the goal is to go up to 350. So we're very low and we're attenuating a lot because it's a lot of light and it, it, it can actually burn your crystals. So we are also developing the technique of serial crystallography wherein you actually burn your crystal but you measure thousands of them to compose a data set. That's the beauty of 
serial crystallography. That's the technique that started at free electron lasers, where you, you don't have a chance. You burn your sample with one shot. But at synchrotrons, especially at fourth generation synchrotrons, we have a chance of taking some more shots at, at each crystal before they actually burn due, due to radiation damage. And then uh, we can follow some um, enzymatic reactions uh, from temperature, for instance. And that's uh, the goal, the main goal of our project from now on. So with, with this being mine, as I, uh, as I just said, we want to address this problem of looking at microcrystals and uh, third generation sources were already working with micro uh, beams. And the, but even then we, we haven't done uh, a lot of, um, this, uh, the, this graph in the back shows the, the number of uh, structures at the protein data bank and how in light blue, how they uh, increase every year. But in, in dark blue, we have new structures. So we actually reach a plateau even with the advent of third generation synchrotrons. So we're starting to, to make a dent here more with the uh, advent of fourth generation and um, um, improvements in current third generation synchrotrons. But the serial crystallography techniques are being used uh, cur um, frequently to allow us to look at very, very small crystals and then especially important for membrane proteins and huge complexes that cannot be studied with the normal techniques at third and second generation sources. There's a few ways of sample delivery for these experiments. We, the, in, the ones that they begin, they, they began using it, uh, the free electron lasers were just jet uh, delivery systems sort of like a capillary in open air where you can uh, drip your crystals in front of the beam. And there's also a way of uh, depositing lots of thousands of crystals in microchips and then screening it in front of the beam. This is uh, what we're beginning with, like with the microchips and microfluidics to, to look at reactions. And with that, we expect to be able to go beyond this limitation of the current technique. And also, with this, uh, since we're going to burn the crystals anyway, we can do the experiments at room temperature. That's something that was done in the beginning of the technique, but for many years now, the technique of cryocrystallography allowed us to, to get more juice from each crystal because we keep them in a stream of nitrogen. But with that, you actually have the, your, your protein sort of frozen in some conformations. Well, when we look at room, room temperature crystals, we can follow some uh, reactions in situ. And that's something very important. And people have been doing this in other um, laboratories already. And we expect to be able to make a mark on that as well. This is a few, uh, it's uh, just a review of the, the methods used for serial crystallography that I just mentioned. So there's the jet-based uh, sample delivery uh, modes and the fixed target that's this one that we're starting with where you have many crystals that deposited in a, in a loop that's sort of similar to what we have currently but they are have lots of like thousands hundreds or thousands of little windows where you can deposit your crystals from proteins or even small molecules because at the at this um, micro and nano limit every powder is a collection of uh, single crystals if you will so that's also being important for the small molecule community. We are starting to work with them as well. So for the, the initial project for the Beam Line, when I joined, the proposal was to just go directly to um, the schematics of the Beam Line. So we, we are an undulator based Beam Line. That's where we, we extract the light from the, the electron beams inside the, the hutch. And it's a, a collection of, electron, of, of magnets that give an, an extra push, push to the to the to the um, X-ray light that's coming out of the ring, and so that increases the flux or the number of photons per area that we can achieve by a lot compared to uh, just extracting them from the the bending magnets. So we then direct this beam through through the wall of the of the um, of the ring to the first component that's a monochromator, 
that's a, a, a set of two crystals that allow us to, to select the energy of the, the light we want to use. So we, in this beamline, we'll be able to go from six to 20 kilo electron volts just by um, moving the, this, the DCM or our double crystal monochromators. And then for this first uh, station, we have two mirrors that are blocks of silicon. When one of them has a rhodium cover, rhodium cover, so that also helps us uh, have uh, better yield at these two energies. And with, with the mirrors, we can focus it to the, the sample position. And with this arrangement, we can vary the, the size of the, of, of, the, um, of the beam at the sample, si uh, the sample position from a 10 to five up to 100 by 80 size. So that gives you a range of the sizes of crystals you can work because we should try to optimize this uh, so as not to uh, damage the crystals too much and to make better use of the of all the, the light we have. This is a very important um, uh, a parameter, especially when we are considering uh, the damage by radiation that can be very important at these kinds of fluxes. And the, the idea for this beam line is to have two stations as like the two colors of the Manaka flower. Uh, we are gonna have, for, starting with the micro Manaka, and then we have the Nano Manaka, as you see here, that, that's basically a continuation of the beam line. After the, the first experimental hutch, we'll be able to just raise the detector and uh, connect the tube that connects it to the second uh, hutch. And in the nano station, we're gonna have another set of mirrors that will allow us to go to um, sub-micron size beams uh, with, with the same energy range and in the resolution and everything. So the original idea was just to go directly to nano, but uh, talking to the community, we have, we have a really good rapport with our uh, user commun community that there was a, a huge push to, to start with the micro beam before we exploit the nano beam uh, experiments that are more similar to what we have at free electron lasers. So here's just another view of the components. And I wanted to show you the, the, the flux. Uh, in the second graph here, we have a, a calculation of what would be the, the flux or number of photons per area, per square uh, center, per square meter at the sample position. And we are at 10 to 13 to 10 to 12 uh, photons per, per 100 milliamps uh, of uh, the current per, per area of the sample, which is comparable to what we have at max four, uh, the other fourth generation synchrotron source. And uh, through um, arrangement of the mirrors, we were able uh, to uh, move the size of the beam that was not initially thought, but lots of things because this was the first beam line and we, we have lots of, we had lots of, um, how should I say, this was like a, um, it was very experimental. So many things we, we are still, uh, during the commissioning, we're seeing that we can change things and implement new techniques uh, uh, beyond what we initially uh, planned. And this has been a, a very uh, exciting exper experience for me as well. So it's a huge uh, engineering effort. It's a big physics uh, achievement, but that's an enormous engineering effort as well. So we have all many different areas of expertise together here. This is a view of what you see when you get to the station. So we have uh, everything in, in granite blocks that if, if I'm not mistaken, came from South Africa and then they were uh, machined in China and sent to us. So it's a very international piece of, uh, uh, of the machine here. So all, this, the, all the mirrors and most of the, the DCM and also the station, they, they, they achieve the, the precision that we need because we have this very stable inertial blocks of granite that fl fluctuate one on top of the other. And that gives us sub-micron uh, precision uh, for the movements in X, Y, and Z. And so with all this, we direct the, sample, the, the beam light to the sample that sits here in a, in a goniometer. And then here is the, the detector, the area detector that we're currently using. And we'll go later to the Pi Mega. Uh, that's our detector based on the 
Meditate's chip. This is another view. So we have uh, all the normal, the standard beamline uh, components. We are we can work on um, the cryo conditions and also on room temperature, as I told you. And we have uh, fluorescence measurements, and we're working on bettering the stability of this goniometer. And uh, a recent um, achievement was the implementation of the automated uh, sample handler. And that's very important when we, we're talking about uh, remote operation, which is our main goal for this, this project. And I'm gonna show you in a minute how it, it turned out. So all the controls were done, uh, can, can be done remotely. So here is just uh, is, is a shot of our uh, Python-based uh, controlling system. This is very also uh, home built. Like uh, we have a very nice uh, software group, so we can I can operate it from from my house if I need. Well, to, to set up the beam line and um, make it uh, ready for users. And this was especially important during the commissioning last year because we started assembling everything in, in its final position right when the pandemic began. So. We are there, the, high, the highest moment of the, the beam line, and then we have to, to cut the number of people in place. And we were having very straight uh, policies of how many people could be in a room. So lots of this were done remotely. So we were doing this uh, a test as we went, uh, preparing for the pandemic uh, or acting during the pandemic. And also the first results were related to, to COVID. This is uh, the interface for data collection, which is uh, an international collaboration called MX Cube that we are part. So it, this involves many synchrotrons around the, wor uh, around the world. Uh, China has just recently joined the group, we're really happy. And uh, it's a very stable and robust interface. This is the image that you have when you're operating. So you, you see here a loop with a, it's a very big crystal here, but it's very clear. We have a really good microscope, uh, that's collinear with the beam. And uh, from here, users can operate, uh, change energy and do uh, align your crystals and select crystals from the uh, remote operation um, robot and everything. And this is um, the important thing is that this version here is web-based. So it's also very light and that allows for this remote operation that we're starting to test now. So I'm very happy about this as well. And this was also, put together by very uh, important people in our software group. So we're part of the international community developing it, but we have a very strong in-house group as well. And this is started at the micromolecular beam line and it's now um, spill, uh, spilling to other beam lines because it's a very good interface and we're starting to adapt it to other beam lines as well. So starting in July next, uh, last year, so we started assembling things in Mar uh, February, March, and in July we were having the first results. So it was, a, a, despite the pandemic, it was a, a really successful endeavor. And we, we were here celebrating the first lysozyme that we got with a, about 100 by 100 beam. This is Andrei Nascimento, one of the researchers in my group. And here's the, the first data we got from lysozyme we went to about one, one angstrom resolution and with a very small beam. So here we used the 10 by seven and all, all the expected results and really good resolution with lysozyme. But lysozyme is just a, like a, a workhorse. And so we, we wanted to look at real samples and I'm gonna show you in a minute. More recently, we just met, we met, we did actual measurements of flux and it's, uh, really uh, co corroborates our um, models and simulations from the beginning, and we are still improving it. But I uh, just wanted to show you this to show like the, the whole range of energy, and we have uh, pretty good flux in all of uh, this uh, range of energy. And we can also attenuate a lot. So that's a little bit uh, uh, controversial, like why do we need to, to have so much flux if we're going to attenuate 90% of it. We, we should be able to do that because every experiment is different. And it's important to have this high flux for the, the next uh, 
uh, kinds of experiments we're going to do. So even though we have a lot of flux, most of the experiments we're doing so far are attenuating a huge part of it. But it's important to have this, um, the possibility of doing it. We, we started uh, varying the energy and doing uh, experiments to, to look at the scattering, anomalous, anomalous scattering from uh, heavy metals. That's very, it's a technique important for um, calculating the phases. So this is gonna be, uh, you'll be able to do um, multiple anomalous diffraction and single anomalous diffraction and all the, the, um, the normal experiments will be able to, to be carried here. And this was a proof of concept looking at iodine, uh, just at, at sitting at nine kilo electron volts and we, we could see a very good signal from um, iodine that's at five. So this was very successful and was a structure from our um, biorenewables uh, group at 1.3 resolution, angstrom resolution. So it was a really good proof of concept. And we have uh, our first external users was a, a group from, uh, as I told you, Professor Glossus Oliva that were looking at the, the first, we start and starting in August, we opened for uh, users with uh, projects related to the SARS-CoV uh, virus to acquire data and help us um, better the line, the beam line. These are um, pictures from, from their study and I'm gonna show you at the end uh, some of um, highlights from their, from the article that we just published. So they, they did not only measure the, uh, with high resolution, one of the, the, the main proteas from, from the coronavirus, and they also did some fragment screening to look at candidates for ligands that can be uh, developed into um, future drugs. But they, they were able to, to look at snapshots of the maturation of the proteas with a resolution, with a very good resolution that we, we got at the beam line. We also had uh, experiments done by our uh, biology lab. One of the um, national labs is the biosciences lab. And they also were looking at, the, at one of the proteases of, of, the, of the virus with different ligands. And this was all done one by one, sort of by hand. We, we weren't working yet with the, with the automated sample, uh, sampler. And these guys here, these kids worked, uh, they, they tested 160 different crystals and collected 77 the full data sets in two days, like nonstop, which in one uh, crystal at a time. So it was a huge achievement uh, despite of, um, of the difficulties. So we, we have lots of structures. I think we're almost uh, 20 structures already at PDB measured at Manaka. And this uh, paper from, from Lauces Oliva's group was uh, just uh, published at JMB. And uh, the, the latest thing that we assembled was the, the sample changer. So this was originally bought for the old synchrotron, but we totally refurbished it and put together the parts in a new arrangement where we now deliver the crystal directly to the goniometer. And we assembled it uh, early the, this year and the, already had the uh, users uh, operating it. So here again, first test done with lysozyme and here's the, the robot operating with users. So this is a, a view from the, from the, the control room. So you can have, you see the, we have cameras looking at the crystal and the, the robot operating. And this is, this, these images you can have also when you're operating from home. So as we were assembling it, all following from our own homes, what was happening there, we were able to follow and solve lots of the problems and the automation and the remote uh, control. So this robot initially would uh, take the crystal and hold it, and the goniometer was at the tip of the of this the mechanic arm, but uh, we reinstalled it and now it just delivers it to, to the goniometer it's in a much more stable um, mode of operation. So these guys from LNBU were the first ones to test it, also with uh, great success. So now people come for two shifts, like if you stay from 9 a.m. To, to 8 p.m., you can collect like 30 data sets easily. 
this is a, it's, again, still taking a few minutes for, for data uh, collection and we intend to make it even faster. So in our macro schedule, the next thing we, we need to do here for this year is we're starting to work on this remote data acquisition. And I'm starting to, uh, to collaborate with, uh, with our users in Chile that normally sent their crystals and came afterwards to, to do the data collection, but they're gonna be our first like uh, guinea pigs to test this remote uh, uh, connection using MX Cube. And uh, we, we hope to have uh, good results with that. We're also working on um, different uh, issues on stability of the, the goniometer mainly, because we want to, to be able to, to, to raster the sample for the serial crystallography. We need to, to improve a lot on the current situation, like mechanically, I, I'd say. And with that, we are also working on the microfluidic setup because in a collaboration with the Bioscience, Bio Biorenewables Lab, we are aiming at solving uh, some of these enzymes that process biomass and look at it um, in real time, like the reaction happening at the crystal. And in parallel now, we're starting to work on the project for the nano station and uh, all, all the the project is more or less done in terms of the optics of it, but we're still trying to get the money for it and uh, put, actually put it together. And as I told you, we're open. Uh, I don't think I, I told you this enough, but we're open for proposals. This is a national facility and we operate under the auspices of our science ministry. And we, we are open for proposals from all over the world. And just because before I finish, I want to show you a snapshot of the. So this is uh, from the paper at JNB. And they were able to have this snapshots at the maturation of the, the main protease. So it basically forms an immature dimer. And then it has two cleavages happening from the N terminal and the C terminal that uh, allow for some conformational changes before it gets to the mature form. And then after that, they also, as I told you, tested a, a different uh, number of, of fragments. So at Diamond, there's a, a platform for fragment screening where you can look at a thousand crystals in, in like two days. So they have a much bigger uh, sample, uh, dewer for samples or you can look at with 500 of them at a time. But these guys were collaborating with us and with Diamond and all, all these measurements here were done here, as I told you, by hand before we had the robot operating. So they were opening the door. And so the experiment is just a few minutes and maybe less than half the time it takes for putting one sample and closing the door coming out. So now with the, the robot, this is much faster, even though we can only look at uh, three pucks of 16 samples at a time. So with that, I'm open for your questions and uh, discussions, Any anything I can help you with, feel free.